Uh, Vice President Biden and Mike Milken are still solving the cancer problem uh, and um, passionate about that. What we saw this morning is really a lot of what the Milken Institute is all about and the Vice President's extraordinary leadership in the moonshot um, <laughs> is a, the perfect uh, setup for uh, this discussion about humankind uh, versus cancer and the current scorecard. Um, on this panel are a whole set of individuals who are trying to rack up more wins as lives rescued, saved, or lives prevented from ever getting cancer. And let me uh, have the pleasure of introducing them. First, as the moderator, I'm Dr. Jonathan Simons. I'm the CEO and president of the Prostate Cancer Foundation. I've been working in prostate cancer research as a physician scientist for now almost 30 years since my first experiment at Johns Hopkins. And the Prostate Cancer Foundation, which was founded by Michael Milken after his diagnosis with prostate cancer, has put $704 million into early stage research over the last 23 years. And the U.S. death rate from prostate cancer over two decades, driven by prostate, the Prostate Cancer Foundation itself, has been reduced by 52%, the largest decrement in death in a solid tumor of any in the top 10. We have here uh, to my immediate left, Dr. Suzanne Tepalian, Associate Director, Bloomberg Kimmel Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy, Johns Hopkins, a melanoma research uh, board member and one of the leading uh, basic and clinical translation or translational scientists in the field of cancer immunotherapy. We have Nils Lindberg, L Lundberg. Close enough. I was close <laughs> enough. Um, I will be slaughtering two French words soon, but we have Niels Lonberg, Senior Vice President, Oncology Discovery uh, Biology, Bristol Myers Squibb. Welcome, Niels. Thank you. I have uh, to my second left uh, Richard Paulson, Amgen. He's the General Manager of the Oncology Business Unit. Welcome, Thank Richard. You, uh, we have as well <laughs> Andre Schulika, uh, Chairman and CEO of Selectus. We have uh, Carlo Greco who's a professor and is the director of clinical research at Champal Limon <coughs> Center for the Unknown in Lisbon. And uh, we have uh, Chris Boshoff, senior vice president, head immune oncology, early development and translational oncology, uh, Pfizer. And what I wanted to start out with was a very simple uh, uh, slide. If you could just bring up slide number two, just to frame of the discussion today. Um, Victio or cancer would have many components, um, but uh, just several uh, we may touch on today would be preventing it in the first place with a new scientific understanding of the genomics of every human cancer. But it should be pointed out in the Abeloff textbook, there are 149, there are actually there are 149 distinct kinds of cancer. And for instance, in breast cancer, we believe at the level of how RNA works off of genes, there are 11 kinds of breast cancer. And yet, in every patient who's unique genetically, there is many forms of breast cancer as there are actually patients ever diagnosed or will be diagnosed. Um, there's early and then much earlier detection, which we may or may not get a chance to talk to, which would be the idea of picking up cancers the size of the head of a pin or a pen rather than picking up when they were about the size of a centimeter of about a blueberry, which is our current ability to detect. We cure patients um, with less than a billion um, to between uh, 10 billion cancer cells. We have a surgical oncologist as well as a uh, physician scientist to my immediate left. We can cure many patients now. You'll hear about <coughs> new ways to do that uh, with bioengineered T cells at relapse if the disease comes back after surgery. We can cure early cancers in the one to $10 billion range, and there are over 37 cancers cured this way with radiation. Uh, you'll hear a bit about uh, the forefront of uh, reducing the side effects from that. And an advanced disease, which is still taking 9 million lives a year on planet Earth, um, uh, right now that's actually 16 911s every day, 365 days a year. For advanced disease, we have an expectation for humankind to conquer that problem. And of course, as the Vice President discussed, there's still an area to improve uh, the wellness or the health span of patients after we've cured them 
Um, and that area of improved survivorship uh, needs more and more attention because there are more patients, there are more cancer survivors on planet Earth right now, and certainly in the United States at over 4 million than in the history of the world, if you're working on the sort. Then you would celebrate that cancer was ended. But I wanted to point out that to solve the other 10,000 plus human diseases, the principles of cancer biology um, are going to be fundamental. If it's Alzheimer's, if it's uh, childhood diabetes, cancer biology has really been the platform um, for, the, um, for life sciences, um, particularly since uh, President Nixon's war on cancer. Um, so with that framework, just one last slide. Uh, that, if you can go to three, please. On the scorecard is a transformation between knowing the genomics and being able to read a whole genome in a human being uh, for well less than $1,000 for 31 centuries since the first cancer case was diagnosed and described actually in hieroglyphics in Egypt. We all lived in the gray zone. But with the understanding now of genes that drive cancers, it's possible now to give patients the blue pill if they have the blue driver mutations, or as you can see, that IV bag for patients who have tumors that express neoantigens and have the right uh, uh, genetic conditions, it's possible actually to give intravenous T cells or monoclonal antibodies. And this whole idea of treating the right patient with the right medicine, whether it's an immunotherapy, antibody, a pill, or a new form of targeted radiation. This whole idea of precision oncology is a part of the scorecard <coughs> when we should be measured. But uh, next slide, please. We just go to um, four. But there are cases after cases now, uh, this is in prostate cancer, where targeted radiopharmaceuticals are putting patients with 10 billion cancers into remission that are specific, or on the right, um, cases where you can precisely predict that T cells after PD-1 treatment can eradicate cancer in the liver and the lymph nodes the size of golf balls. And we're starting to see, you can see this T cell with boxing gloves in the far right. We're starting to see that um, cancer medicines themselves can no longer simply even be considered to be the, the very important early days of poisons for fast growing cancer cells of the 20th century. So on the scorecard, uh, for humankind versus cancer are entirely new ways of delivering medicines or cells to eradicate tens of billions of cancer cells as opposed to uh, uh, a billion or uh, even less than a billion with basically <laughs> the entire armamentarium of cancer medicines for the last 30 centuries. So with that, let's go um, to the scorecard on the extraordinary in biotechnology. And Andre, uh, would you talk to us a little bit about where we are in the scorecard for uh, genetic engineering solutions to uh, cancers using T cells? Oh, yeah, okay, well, so T cells are like in the same line of development as immune oncology. So we went from uh, Chemotherapy. Chemotherapy can be figured out as a <coughs> carpet bombing in a patient. I could try to stop every cell that is dividing, and as cancer cells divide more quickly than the others, then you try to shrink them. And then you have the idea of trying to bring some like weapons that would target exactly, very precisely cancer cells, monoclonal antibodies that have a warhead that can recognize uh, a cancer cell, but a cancer cell cannot be killed by a naked monoclonal antibody if the gene that ex is expressed on the surface that is rec recognized, <laughs> what's called a tumor surface antigen, is expressed at a lesser than 100,000 molecule on the surface. So the cell has to be overcoated with this. And you have a handful of these genes. And therefore, like few monoclonal antibodies that work this way, let's say like rituximab or septin, uh, uh, Erbitox and others. Then people tried to target genes that were lesser expressed than these genes. For example, they tried to link with this monoclonal antibody something that would be more toxic, like a chemical. Then you have an antibody drug conjugate. Therefore, the monoclonal antibody would bind on this and would concentrate on the cell, and the cell will have a lot of poison around, and the cell will be killed by this ADC. 
And then the threshold, like the minimum floor for this type of targeted therapies to work in oncology to work, is approximately 10,000 molecules expressed on their surface. And then they tried to find another way to do this. They said, okay, well, T cells are a very powerful engine that can kill a cell because they're usually trained to at least kill cells that are, they, like, for example, infected by flu. So they imagine a, a thing that is bispecific antibodies. On one side, the bispec will bind, for example, to the CD3 on the T cell and will drag the T cell down and plug the T cell on the cancer cell through another tip of a monoclonal antibody, and the T cell will make the kill. It's like they create Velcro. Exactly. They Velcro themselves right on. It's a kind of a Velcro. I'm like, it's slightly more complicated than a Velcro, <laughs> but it, it can be recognized as a Velcro. Therefore, you can go on certain tumor-associated antigen that is expressed, let's say, like 1,500 on the cell. And then a new ID came up that just directly plug inside the T cell the tip of a monoclonal antibody and send to the T cell a signal to kill. But there is a second thing inside the T cell. It's not only kill, but also amplify. And that's what the power of these new technologies that are coming up based on T cells, a product called CAR T cells. So it's a chimeric antigen receptor that is plugged inside and the T cell will enter inside the body and it w you, you just see the, the patient with a few hundred thousand or million cells and the cell will start entering in the patient, will sniff the first uh, cancer cell, plug onto, uh, onto this cell and then will release weapons called perforins, so we make perforations, and granzymes and the granzyme will kill and it will lead 15 minutes approximately to recharge weapons and can kill a second cell and a third and will start amplifying while the first encounter with the cancer cell, they'll start amplifying like gremlins inside the patient and will have a strong amplification up to the size of the tumor and will start reducing the tumor. So the first patient that were treated, let's say five years ago at the uh, University of Pennsylvania, some of these patients had two pounds of tumor, few weeks to live. And these patients were injected with a few million cells of right. these CAR T cells. So and then that, you have this huge expansion. Right, that's about two pounds. That's as much cancer yeah. uh, that these serial T cells just basically ran around the body and eliminated. And a few millions, you cannot see it with your eyes. Approximately, you can see maybe a pellet. And then this huge expansion melt down the tumor in billions of cells. It's billions of cells, like wh what you showed here. And there's a strong fever that comes inside the patient and this meltdown up to the time it takes approximately two weeks and the patient are put in complete remission. And the first patient that have been treated are still in complete remission today. You have some relapses, of course, but it's a very powerful tool because it can get out from the blood vessels and hunt for any type of tumor under the skin or solid tissues. It's the new, new frontier in this space. So what, one thing on the scorecard of humankind versus cancer is that cancer medicines of the future will include T cells and that um, there, you actually make more medicine in your body. They don't just go around as serial killers looking to Velcro down and, and basically assassinate a cancer cell that it recognizes and leave the rest alone, but you actually keep making them. Now, Dr. Tapalian um, and her program has studied um, uh, T cells and how they might be activated without with your own T cells, without even having to get them out and bioengineer them. And so Sam, why don't you talk a little bit about what, um, why on the scorecard something transcendent happened in the last three years where uh, melanoma and now a subset of even advanced lung cancer, for instance, mm -hmm. has patients with T cells um, in them where it's not clear these terminally ill patients are going to die from cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, we have known for many years that the body can mount an immune response against cancer. And some of us, like Jonathan and I, have been studying this for about 30 years now. Uh, the question was how could we re-educate or tune the immune system to effectively destroy cancer cells? 
It took a while, I think, for technology to catch up with our ideas. Um, over the past three decades, we tried many things that didn't work so well. Uh, but at, a, at every attempt, there were always a small group of patients who did respond to the treatment, whether it be T-cell transfer, cancer vaccines, uh, uh, cytokines like interleukin-2. Uh, and so this kept us working on the problem. It was only more recently that we realized that the immune system has these pathways that we call checkpoints. And a checkpoint, everybody knows what Checkpoint Charlie is. It's the same idea that checkpoints hold the immune system at bay. Um, normally, they turn off immune uh, responses at the right time so that, for instance, if you have pneumonia, you don't destroy normal lung tissue while your body is trying to fight off the pneumonia infection. But in cancer, the cancers can co-opt these checkpoints um, to essentially put up a shield against the immune system. So first in melanoma and then later in other diseases, more recently, just in the past few years, we have found that by giving blugs, drugs that block these checkpoints, just simply that, we can cause the, either the complete disappearance or partial regression <clears throat> of very advanced cancers. And actually, if I could have slide number one, um, I'd like to just show you what the timeline is like uh, for this development. So this is a six and a half year timeline um, of the development of a immune checkpoint blocking drugs. Uh, and this is showing all of the FDA approvals. And actually, uh, this slide was obsoleted on Monday, just two days ago, when there was another approval of a new checkpoint uh, blocker. And, and this was Dervalumab from AstraZeneca. And so now uh, we have six immune checkpoint blockers, so I would change the title, and uh, four different biomarker tests because part of this development was coming up with a biomarker that could help us find patients who were more likely to that's, respond. That's where the precision the comes in, That's right? where the precision comes in. You have a companion diagnostic. Right. I keep going. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Melanoma timeline is at the top of, of that graph. Melanoma has really led the way, research in melanoma. Um, you probably know that most melanomas, if caught early, are highly curable just by standard surgery. Uh, but about 15% of patients with melanoma will develop disseminated disease. Ten years ago, if a melanoma patient was in that situation, their, their median life expectancy was less than 12 months. Uh, now, um, we're not really sure what it is because the, um, you know, we, uh, the data are coming so quickly, uh, but, but we know now that many patients are surviving for a long time uh, with advanced melanoma thanks to these kinds of drugs. And then on the bottom of that graph, I'm showing all of the other cancer types now that have been shown to respond to immune checkpoint blockers, uh, where the FDA has approved these drugs for lung cancer, bladder cancer, head and neck, Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, et cetera. Uh, this is a very, very exciting uh, time for those of us who study cancer immunology. And uh, the best part is that these drugs can be partnered with other kinds of therapies. So you heard about T-cell therapy. They could be used in combination uh, with CAR T-cells. They can be used in combination with chemotherapy. We'll hear about radiation uh, therapy on this panel. Um, and kinase inhibitors, the so-called precision drugs, although the, these are also precision drugs. Can you explain just um, um, with patients now, let's take melanoma, mm -hmm. that are now five, eight, even ten years out, how do you talk at Johns Hopkins to patients who were told they were terminally ill, uh, who still have persistent immunity to their cancer, but you can't find their cancer on scans? Mm -hmm. When do they get to declare uh, that they're cured? Well, it's interesting the way that the patients talk about themselves, uh, because um, most patients are, are satisfied with keeping the cancer at bay because most of our patients don't have symptoms and they live normal lives. Uh, it, you know, we always are aiming for a cure, uh, but another good scenario is keeping the cancer at bay, turning it into a chronic disease, uh, similar to our experience with HIV, where HIV is never eradicated, but it is very well controlled. Right. Yeah. And, and there are patients, right, that have small deposits of something yeah. on scans exactly. that, that just never grow back. Mm -hmm. 
Right. They don't disappear either. So it's, it may yeah. be just like a Cold War situation. Yes, exactly. Where you live out your, your health exactly. span. Exactly, yes. Um, so that's not a 20th century story of any cancer medicines. That's uh, on the scorecard for the 21st. Yes. We'll come back to um, how melanoma and cancers that are chemotherapy resistant uh, are, are so important actually um, to continue to pursue in this direction and other directions in a moment. But I thought what I would do is um, I would uh, ask, uh, ask um, uh, Nils, uh, your company's been incredibly involved as an investor, so is Chris's, in this whole field. Um, when you're looking at all this, what's your company thinking about now for the future of unlocking the immune system, for instance, against cancer? One word, combinations. <laughs> <laughs> and that takes us back to what uh, Joe Biden said this morning. I was struck by his, uh, um, his call for partnerships. We have to partner. No one company has all the answers. And we recognize that, and we are committed to that, and we've been committed to that. He started out talking about HIV as an example, and that's also a pretty good example for our company. In 2004, we formed a partnership with a competitor, Gilead, and we combined our drugs with their drugs. We came up with a single, once-a-day pill for HIV, and we're doing that over and over again in immunotherapy. It's probably harder to find a drug company that we're not partnered with than a drug company we're partnered with. And I'll give one example. Um, <coughs> Johnson & Johnson, one of the largest drug companies on earth. We've partnered with them to take one of their drugs and combine it with one of our drugs and see if we can um, have a real impact on patients. And that drug of theirs is also a partnership story. They came up with that drug in a partnership with a small biotech company. That small biotech company came up with that drug by <laughs> licensing a technology that we invented that came out of my lab. So it's a big network and everyone talks to each other. And that network is not just biotech companies and pharmaceutical companies, it's academic um, biotech pharmaceutical partnerships. So Dr. Topalian and I started a collaboration over a dozen years ago and that was critical for the development of Opdiva. University to company. Yes. Yeah. And are the partnerships easier this year? Because you have these, you know, they're, we call them Amazo scans. Um, you saw some where you would never have seen this in the 20th century in terms of, you know, baseball, a base, uh, Major League Baseball amount of total cancer in a patient's body that's disappeared uh, by just unleashing uh, their own T cells in a way. Is, is partnership easier right now between companies um, in this? Uh, growing uh, place of making new kinds of cancer medicines or is it still challenging and if challenging why there are challenges it's interesting one of the challenges that we have faced and we've really worked hard on it is to form three-way partnerships or more than three-way partnerships where we're partnering with an academic institution but that academic institution is also partnering with another academic institution. So we formed a network, it's called the ION Network, and Johns Hopkins and Suzanne are um, instrumental in this network, and it allows us to partner very broadly with multiple players in the field, because again, nobody has all the answers. Thank you. Um, Chris, uh, from the perspective of uh, Pfizer listening to all of this, um, and with the idea that there's a lot of discovery still to do. What, what are the top priorities for your group right now uh, across all these different um, cancers that can't be conquered right now f with chemotherapy or hormonal therapy? Or yeah, any? so that's an important question. I think um, just on a high level, um, we still know that the majority of patients with cancer will not respond to immunotherapy. And in fact, the majority of patients that do respond will eventually they, their disease will progress. The most common cancers, prostate cancer, ER-positive breast cancer, colorectal cancer, in general, do not currently respond to immunotherapy. And we'll say, for the audience, in general, it'd be less than, let's say, 10 in 100 patients Correct. with our best amazing armamentarium Correct. will respond, even though there may be, in that 10% patients that we could pick right out now, 
and treat and put into a complete remission. Absolutely right? correct. So there's your context. And I think often the general public believes that immunotherapy is going to be the next cure for, for all cancers, and that's certainly not the case. So what we believe at Pfizer is that immunotherapy will become one of the pillars. We'll continue to have radiation and more model, m uh, modern forms of radiation with chemotherapy and, and surgery as a pillar of, of, of cancer treatment. Um, precision medicine or targeted therapies like um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, the, these will co continue to be a pillar of cancer medicine. And then a new pillar emerging is other targeted therapies like ADCs, antibody drug conjugates, which yeah, you referred to. Can you just to. for a second, that's mm -hmm. a good one. Just explain uh, for a second to the audience what an ADC is. So an antibody drug conjugate is essentially an antibody that's loaded with a cytotoxic. With a, it's poison um, on one end. It's a poison on one end a, and, and it's stick to an antibody and that antibody is um, engineered to target cancer cells. Um, and that's a very potent way to potentially um, target um, toxins, killer payloads, we call them payloads, to tumor cells. Mm -hmm. And it happens that some of these so-called um, ADCs work particularly well with immunotherapy, for example, but they also work well with other forms of cancer therapy. So ADCs and other forms of targeted therapies like using nanoparticles to target toxins to the tumor microenvironment, these are emerging as another very important pillar of cancer medicine. So our own strategy is diverse to make sure that we've got um, molecules within each and medicines within each of these pillars and then really work out in a rational way how we can combine them. There's currently, specifically with the checkpoint in inhibitors, hundreds of studies ongoing. Most of these are empirical. There's no biological rationale. They were not tested preclinically whether they specifically will work. And I am worried that many of these studies will actually read out negative, and that will have, a, in the longer term, a very negative impact overall on the immunotherapy field. So for us, it's rational combinations to make sure that we understand the biology, that we understand why we want to combine this specific medicine with this specific medicine, and then perhaps most importantly is discovering the biomarkers or using biomarkers. So recently, for example, we acquired um, a, a so-called PARP inhibitor from a company called Medivation. PARP inhibitors specifically work in cancers where there's a specific type of DNA damage. So we want to use these PARP inhibitors with immunotherapy or with other drugs by selecting patients that do have that specific DNA damage. So precision medicine, biomarkers, and doing small studies <coughs> with these rational combinations. Yeah, these uh, PARP inhibitors are drugs that exploit uh, and kill cancer cells that can't do the autocorrect. They can't spell check. They lose their spell checker, um, biochemically speaking, on DNA as they divide. And that makes them actually wickedly sensitive to a drug that um, basically wipes them out because they can't fix the proofreading. And it's, a pr it's also a product of this extraordinary last 40 years of trying to understand how genes work and the basic science of even how DNA is uh, replicated. Um, Shakespeare commented on oncology um, himself in actually when the apothecary um, says, uh, disease, uh, this is in Hamlet if you check, and I think it's, it's the fourth act. Uh, diseases desperate grown are by desperate measure relieved or not at all. And a lot of oncology is a sense of urgency and even desperation in facing patients with a basically a day of health and a biopsy and a life-threatening situation. But um, the last part of the 20th century and in the 21st, um, We've evolved into whole new areas of precision treatment that lessen side effects without uh, reducing efficacy or cure rates. And um, Carlo Greco is one of the leaders in this area in uh, radiation. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what your program's doing in London and why the future of treating cancers and scaling cancers globally uh, will involve radiation, but not like um, in the same way uh, chemotherapy will, uh, we, we're in a century where no one up here is talking about cell poisons. Um, this century is going to be about precision radiation in whole new ways. 
Absolutely. Um, let me start off by saying that um, we're very excited because we are experiencing a um, paradigm shift in the use of radiation therapy in the treatment of um, cancer. Uh, uh, as a community, we've been trapped in a dogma that you have to fractionate uh, in order to spare normal tissues uh, from being harmed by radiation and achieve the best possible uh, cure rates. In fact, we have known for a number of years and the uh, experience in the brain um, has taught us a lot that if we do use high doses of radiation, even in a single uh, session, uh, we can achieve very high cure rates. Uh, in a context which is an extreme, extremely delicate uh, uh, anatomical context, of course, such as the brain. But nobody dared to utilize extreme uh, doses of radiation outside of the brain because um, A, we didn't have the tools up until recently, and B, we were stuck in this uh, dogma that we had to fractionate. And only recently, thanks to the advent of very uh, advanced forms of uh, 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 technology, uh, which not only has given us a virtual scalpel, so that we do have uh, tools to sculpt uh, the dose on the tumor. Yeah, and explain why um, uh, computing power, CPU, Absolutely. why all of a sudden radiation isn't like a flashlight blast of radiation, but it can be as exquisitely contoured as it the all best surgeon. It all boils down to advanced imaging. Uh, there is no high precision radiation therapy without advanced imaging. And this is where I think the community has been lagging behind. Uh, uh, radiation oncologists have not been trained uh, so far to um, grasp uh, 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 imaging uh, to the level that is required um, to uh, deliver high doses of radiation uh, to the tumor, painting the dose in a way that it's um, tumor specific, sparing the critical structures that are surrounding the uh, tumor. And this is all happening now. And we have known that um, delivering high doses of radiation is in fact more effective uh, than fractionated radiation therapy and multiple giving treatments. it I mean, multiple treatments over a course of a month or more. And uh, the, finally, uh, we're breaking away from fractionated radiotherapy into what we call hypofractionated. There's a few sessions only, uh, uh, which adds to the patient convenience, but also potentially to better uh, uh, tumor cures and survival outcomes. And not only that, we can do it with exquisite precision, and it doesn't matter what platform you use, uh, uh, but um, they are all very advanced. It's about the teamwork that's behind it. It's how the doctor. On the team? It, yeah, on the team, of course, uh, the radiation oncologist that, uh, that, that, that drives the, the efforts. But of course, it's a team of physicists, a team of technologists, and all together as a team produce what um, is to be, uh, of course, the most personalized, ideally, uh, treatment that will target the tumor effectively and will spare the normal tissues. Now, the computation power is uh, truly um, uh, um, important uh, because we now have uh, ability to dose paint uh, the radiation to where it's really needed and spare normal tissues which may be embedded within the tumor itself. And um, that requires a lot of uh, work and of course a lot of quality assurance before the patient is treated. Now, we have spearheaded a very um, exciting uh, project at the Champlain Milk Foundation for the Unknown. And um, um, aside from treating metastatic, oligometastatic tumors with single dose. Oligometastatic means just a just few a, metastases. Uh, we have started treating two to three. prostate cancer uh, with a single fraction, a single session of radiation. Uh, having gone through the experience with tracking tools to make sure that we were spot on within a millimeter or so. Uh, uh, delivering the dose where it was really needed, sparing the normal tissues uh, surrounding the uh, prostate. And uh, we've done it very successfully with five sessions, much like many other institutions around the world. But then we've run a uh, randomized trial, a phase two randomized trial, uh, which has implemented the same exact technique uh, with a single event. And patients love it. Uh, it is one event which solves their problem with no anesthesia, no hospital admission. It's on an outpatient basis. 
Of course, everything is done behind the scene. It takes a full day. It's very labor intensive for and us a lot of to prepare a, lot of, a lot of computing power, a lot of quality assurance. But once everything is ready and it's been confirmed as feasible, the patient comes in within 15 minutes, the delivery is over and uh, there are no significant side effects. And I can say, and it's interesting, that we tortured our patients more with questionnaires, quality of life questionnaires, to make sure that they really didn't have any significant side effects than with the treatment itself. And we have found that um, indeed uh, a single dose, and this is clearly prostate cancer once again leading the way forward uh, to broaden the horizons of the application of such advanced techniques in many other clinical settings uh, that is really um, uh, beginning to be uh, for real. And uh, we hope to see this obviously proliferate um, and elsewhere. scale. So you can take Google Maps and you look at somebody's backyard and what they had in it, and you can actually paint it on PowerPoint. And while I, I was very disrespectful to the extraordinary R&D that went into this, the concept that a lot of cancer treatment in the future of early cancers, particularly in the developing world, where you wouldn't have a world-class surgical oncologist might be delivered even remotely uh, by a radiation oncologist is a concept uh, that's fairly um, uh, emergent. Suzanne, the vice president talked about busting silos and changing cultures, and Mike Milken invented the five-page grant and the funding in 60 days, um, and again, $704 million <coughs> later in research support. Um, there's no question that urgency around great uh, cancer search ideas pays mm -hmm. out in new drugs and increased survival. Talk, what's your perception right now of how siloed, uh, how much um, data hoarding is there in the cancer research ecosystem, and what should we do about it? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there's a public perception, and not just from Mr. Biden, but I mean, I think generally that the public is still wary of uh, people who do scientific research and uh, uh, medical research, and um, there's, uh, there's a notion that we are holding back um, uh, the, the best results and, and that we're not working together. But I, I think, you know, this, this panel is evidence uh, that people are working together and we're talking about all different sectors now, all the stakeholders. So I'm in academia, but we have government, we have pharma, we have nonprofits, um, we have philanthropy. Uh, all of this now is being brought to bear. I, I think we all have a common goal. Um, uh, progress can't happen quickly enough. Um, you know, on the other hand, we don't want to dump unvetted data into bad the data. pool, yes, bad bad data. Um, the Worms. data needs to be inspected. It needs to be cleaned, and when it's ready, um, then it should be made available. And otherwise, you know, we end up spinning our wheels, uh, chasing after results that that aren't real. Uh, and that's something that I also don't th think that the public uh, realizes is how there's a proper way, a proper path to conduct scientific research. Uh, Richard Paulson, yeah. you've been, uh, your company's been incredibly committed to innovation mm -hmm. and also uh, in biotechnology to patient education. And when you, uh, so what, what's happening um, in oncology right now in innovation at Amgen and how is Amgen uh, trying to um, uh, educate the public about the essential value of um, the biopharma sector to basically victory over cancer. Yeah, I mean, I think what we're hearing now, Jonathan, we've heard it even, you know, in this panel this morning, is, is that, you know, the great, the innovative medicines provide the greatest hope uh, when we look at both the, 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 the personal or the, the human impact of cancer and the financial impact, right? So if we're going to address that moving forward, uh, I think we've seen over the past couple decades, we've actually been able to reduce cancer mortality rates by over 22%, right? And that reduction has been driven, you know, largely by biopharmaceuticals. In fact, 80% of the benefit has been driven by biopharmaceuticals. So for us as a company, we say, how do we continue to innovate and how do we continue to bring novel therapies that are going to help us continue moving forward? And it's, it's, a, it's a great benefit to patients and to their families but it's also a great benefit to society because for every 1% reduction we get in cancer mortality, 
know, there's an accrued value to society of over $500 billion. Yeah, the, that's uh, Milken. It's amazing. Uh, yes. The Milken <laughs> Institute, if you, do you, you want to just repeat that statistic? I think for, for every 1% reduction in cancer mortality, there's an accrued value to society of over $500 billion. So if you really wanted to add to your GDP, just um, what you would do is uh, conquer all human diseases as expertly as possible. Yeah. But certainly cancer is in the leading position now. Well, I think uh, cancer is in the leading position because, you know, sadly we still have in the U.S. more than half a million patients dying from cancer per year. It's so almost 2,000 a day. Yeah. Right? So we have a lot more to do. And I think for us as a company, we're very focused on the innovation side to say how do we continue to push the boundaries of science to develop new innovation. But also importantly, we've heard about collaborations. And it's how do we work with all partners across the healthcare <coughs> system to say we need a system which provides patients access to innovation. If we have all this science and all this technology and all this great innovation, but patients don't get access to it, it doesn't matter. Nils, in the ecosystem where they're, um, you're vital, the patients are vital, um, the FDA is vital, um, the uh, philanthropy is vital, what are you most concerned about right now in the ecosystem uh, for accelerating, reducing actually the time from discovery to the first uh, 500 patients whose cancers are uh, either eliminated um, or put in suspended animation for as far out into their lifespan as we can envisage? You know, I think one of the things that we have to do better is get the most out of clinical trials. Clinical trials are an incredible opportunity to gather data. And I talk to patients all the time who are on clinical trials. I'm amazed by their dedication. I mean, these people are putting their lives on the line for an experiment, and they're committed um, not just for themselves, but also for future cancer patients. And we owe it to them to really get a lot out of clinical trials. Now, fortunately, there's been tremendous convergence of technologies that allow this to happen. We've talked about imaging, um, computational power, just data storage, DNA sequencing. <clears throat> um, a whole host of technologies have converged that make it easier, I think, to really get the most out of patient samples. But what's missing right now is the ability to actually ask those questions. There are rules that govern what questions you can ask of a patient sample. And those rules vary across every institution that conducts clinical trials. So all the hospitals have their own rules. And it can be often very difficult, if not impossible, to ask a question in a way that is statistically meaningful because of this wide variety of different rules. And so we need to work on that so we can really, really get the most out of clinical trials. Again, we owe it to the patients. Why, uh, Nils, do you think that it's still only four or five Americans out of a hundred that participate in clinical trials, you know, I, e even with this, you know, putting yeah. up data like this, yeah. now that, or like this, that, or like that, that that, that is an impediment. Um, but I would toss that question to Suzanne. Um, she's closest to the patients. Well, not everybody needs a clinical trial, right? And especially now with uh, with all these new options approved by by FDA. Um, but, um, you know, really, um, it, unless a patient is at a major medical center, and, and in most cases academic centers, they may not be offered a clinical trial. So if they are um, seeing a, a community oncologist to, to treat them, they, they may not be offered a clinical trial. So I think that that's one of our challenges, really, is to educate not only the patients that these trials exist, but also to educate oncologists everywhere. And there's a huge movement to do this now at all the major oncology conferences and, you know, with online tools, et cetera, uh, just so that people know what the options are that are available to them. Well, one thing also, like putting everyone on clinical trial is not that easy because we have to say something. There is like a lot of cancers that are diagnosed very early stage and are treated by standard of care, which are available and are well treated. Therefore, most of the clinical trials start maybe at second line or third line. It depends on the cancers. For example, certain cancers are total orphan diseases with absolutely no cure. Some others might have maybe, for example, we're launching a clinical trial for acute myeloid leukemia. The standard of care is 30 years old. 
the last drug to be approved in this space is like 10 years old. And therefore, maybe here in this case, like you have maybe help in the recruitment of people, or maybe you can recruit people for first line if your drug proves like maybe safer, but everyone doesn't apply for a clinical trial. Um, Chris, with uh, the rise of social media, yeah. uh, the good and the bad, um, but the awareness is a, uh, uh, you, Twitter um, and certainly Facebook have become uh, places where patient communities have self-organized. We have an ex extraordinary one growing in prostate cancer. Um, how is your company looking at patient education um, <coughs> in a place where patients might get it completely differently than from the newspapers or from television. Yeah. So, so that is critical and all large biopharma have various tools now and various capabilities put in place to work directly with patients, more specifically also with um, patient advocacy group um, to educate, not just to educate about our compounds, but to educate about the disease and to educate about the disease paradigm because for patients with cancers, not just the this is your current treatment, is yeah. what's going to happen afterwards. If, if the tumor should progress on this specific therapy, what comes next? What comes next? Well, patients want to know the sequence of treatment, of the, of the whole treatment paradigm. So I think patient um, education and engagement, working with patient advocacy groups are essential. Um, something else you touch upon is clinical trials. I think there's a transformation now in the way clinical trials are being done. Remember in the past it was phase one, phase two, then phase three. Do you want to just explain one was it's safe enough? So phase one was often taking a new molecule, just see if it's safe enough and what is the dose? What could be the correct, the, the best dose for that phase specific two? therapy? Then phase t um, two often was a standard, stat a, a single arm experience to look at efficacy. But often from a phase two, you can't actually say how good it is against standard of care because it's a single arm experience. And specifically, if it's a small number, 30 or 50 patients or 100 patients typically in a phase two study, it's difficult to conclude how effective it is. And then and will come the, three? then the big phase three, which is the registrational or pivotal study, registrational tent, large randomized study, hundreds of patients with a new therapy against standard of care, and often standard of care plus placebo, and the placebo will be in place of the new therapy. So that, that treatment paradigm for drug development often took 10 years. With the incredible support and leadership of Rick Pastor leading the oncology division at the FDA, there's a real urgency how we can develop drugs and how we are developing drugs now, going from a phase one study directly into a pivotal study. And in fa fact, many of the cancer drugs are now actually, the first approval is on single arm experiences without doing a large phase three study. Um, so I'll give you two quick examples. For example, um, there's this genetic alteration in lung cancer called ROS1. It's a rare genetic alteration. Uh, we happen to have a small tyrosine kinase inhibitor, yeah. crizotinib, it's, that works against... Yeah, it's the pink pill against the pink cancer that right. has the ROS1 mutation not just anybody that walks in the room. Not just anyone, so you have to select patients, but we know with patients with that specific, in their cancers, <coughs> that specific genetic alteration, this drug has a meaningful difference in outcome. So both in Europe with the EMA and with the FDA, they approved crizotinib in this indication on the single arm experience because of real world data. By real world data, I mean knowing what is the historical outcome for patients with this disease, with this specific ge genetic alteration, getting standard of care chemotherapy. So clearly crizotinib, a small molecule, or a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, has a meaningful impact. So they didn't ask us to continue to do a large randomized phase three study. It just would have been inappropriate. Similarly, recently we had approval for our checkpoint inhibitor, Avilimab, uh, PDL1, anti-PDL1 immunotherapy in a rare cancer called Merkel cell carcinoma <coughs> on a small single arm experience because we know patients with Merkel cell carcinoma, a rare type of skin cancer, very few patients with metastatic Merkel cell carcinoma survive for 12 months or for 24 months and clearly this treatment was meaningful. So knowing the historical data, the real world data, that was helpful for the agencies to give approval uh, in a very accelerated way. 
Richard, um, more and more patients uh, in our world and with advanced prostate cancer um, want to know uh, what their genome is mm -hmm. and who's got a medicine for it. How is Amgen looking at um, social media and patient engagement um, where patients know that it's not just the diagnosis, but um, the medicines are going to come partly, the best medicines are going to come partly from uh, medicines that match up against the genes that their uh, tumors have mutated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question, and to build on the answer, what, you know, at Amgen, we recognize it's much more than just the medicines, as you said. And, and I think we've launched a very novel partnership a number of years ago, which we actually call Breakaway from Cancer. And it's engaging patient groups from, from prevention through to survivorship. So there's four different national not-for-profit patient organizations that engage in, in putting together, you know, combined resources to help educate patients on prevention, uh, on treatment and on survivorship so that for them, their families and their caregivers, they get to better understand the, the, you know, the cancer journey and what can they expect as they go through the cancer journey. And a big part of that, as you mentioned, is, is talking about the evolution of personalized medicine and how as, as we're getting better at understanding biomarkers, getting better at understanding you know, what patients will benefit from certain medicines better than other medicines. In, in the past, it was just very broad. And now as we use biomarkers, and as you talked about, you know, specifically for us, I believe we're one of the leaders in looking at you know, metastatic colorectal cancer and advancing new biomarkers, continuing to do more research, working with the FDA, uh, and working with partners to get better diagnostic testing to make sure that patients who will really benefit from a, an amazing medicine are the right ones getting it. And those who won't benefit as much, you know, don't get it. That's, that's where we're getting in terms of personalized medicine. Um, what I thought I'd do to wrap this up is let every panelist write a prescription, uh, kind of a virtual prescription. Um, they can write one or two prescriptions, uh, but they, um, they have unlimited the resources, um, prescriptions to uh, accelerate, basically, our victory over cancer at any level. And I, I wanted to start with you, Nils. What, what prescription would you leave the audience? Well, I've already given one prescription, and that is uh, harmonization of uh, um, consent rules for, anal for, for analyzing clinicals, uh, right. clinical trial samples. But my business, I mean, what I'm focused on is drug discovery. And uh, I think that there's some real improvements that can be made in, uh, in drug discovery tools. We have gotten to the point where we are at right now because of mouse cancer models. And everyone uh, denigrates mouse cancer models. Yes, we've cured cancer over and over again in a mouse, but we wouldn't have gotten there. We wouldn't have gotten where we are today, and I, I think we've made fantastic progress in the last 20 years without these models, but we can do better. And so we really need to invest in better models, and not just um, animal models, also um, ex vivo patient uh, sample models. So even better models of cancer to do clinical trial simulations in yeah. before the patient gets them. Exactly, and particularly to explore combinations. I'm going to go back sure. to my one, so my one, word, my one word combinations. We're doing a lot of combination right. trials. Right. right now, for our immunotherapy trials, we have over 200 clinical trials going on, and most of those are combination trials where we're combining multiple drugs. Right. It's very difficult to explore the combination space in the clinic. If we can explore it earlier with meaningful models, then I think we can, we can get to um, a good place faster. That's a great prescription. Richard? Yeah, I mean, I think we've just heard this morning, right, the pace of change in technology is amazing with regards to how we're advancing medicine, how we're advancing science. And I truly think we're on the cusp of a revolution in biotechnology medicines. And as everyone is working to develop immunotherapies, um, you know, novel immunologics to be able to bring in place viral therapy and, and new medicines based on our better understanding of, of the genome, uh, we need to make sure that patients have access to those medicines. Access. Right? So access to medicines to ensure that we can really address the human and the economic cost of disease is my one prescription. So focus, your prescription is relentless access. effort on uh, ac patient access. Yes. Okay. Suzanne, what's your prescription? Uh, my prescription is for collaboration. So I think that collaboration among all the stakeholders in the different sectors of biomedical research has brought us to where we are today. Um, I think it can be even further improved, uh, and that essentially means um, a need for funding. 
no bucks, no buck rogers. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's in part of the incentive part. And then there are disincentives right now to collaboration as well as a requirement for resources and incentives. Do you want to write it? Is there any prescription you want to write the second about uh, eliminating a disincentive to collaboration? I, I think a major disincentive is um, legal uh, in terms of uh, intellectual property, who owns which discoveries. And um, ha having said that, uh, I think that um, our colleagues in the legal space who are inclined to make these things happen can work miracles. Mm -hmm. You're not yeah. going to quote Shakespeare again, are you? <laughs> I could. Yeah, you're, yeah. <laughs> I won't quote Shakespeare, but yeah. I have a, a lawyer who's a patient who thinks that um, we should have lawyers with cancer for cancer research as a, as a new area of, uh, mm. uh, of corporate law. Um, What's, we'll come down this way. Uh, what's your, pres write a prescription for us. Um, two things. Um, I'll go back to your original reducing 1% the cancer burden and the economic benefit the, of that. Mm -hmm. um, prevention and <coughs> early detection. Prevention, um, there's enormous ways we can do it globally. Vaccines, remember in sub-Saharan Africa, cervical cancer is still one of the most common cancers in women. There's a vaccine for HPV. Um, prevention, education on diet, including alcohol intake. We now know that even moderate alcohol intake increase the burden of certain cancers, including breast cancers. And of course, smoking. The burden of smoking-related cancers in places like China, Russia, um, and the developing world is going to be enormous during the next 20 years. So I think prevention with smoking, diet, alcohol, vaccine, alcohol, less alcohol intake and, and vaccines could, be, could have the biggest impact. Early detection, we know that the majority of cancers can actually be cured with surgery, including radiotherapy. Um, so early detection from simple things of patient education to discover early lumps and bumps to complex high-tech things we can invest in um, for new blood markers, circulating DNA that can be picked up in blood that can tell us early on whether an individual will develop cancer or have early cancer. Great. Andre? Well, my prescription would be to have like a invest a lot of energy in understanding the deep molecular nature of the cancers with a big S because there's plenty of them. It's not 200 plus, it's more than this. Each cancer is really specialized. So the real characterization of the cancer cell and what it represents is one of the first bases. And the second thing is of course combo therapy that I think like you cannot tackle the cancer with a single drug. Everyone's saying this. And let's say, for example, you can do radiotherapy and at the place of the painting, I love the, the term actually, and the, the lesion of the cancer. After this, you can, for example, inject, like, let's say, CAR T cells. They'll start hunting for the cancer cells that start floating in the blood and went somewhere else, potentially metastasize to clean this. It's these combo therapy that would help people not to be put in complete remission, but maybe hope for a cure, which is a difficult word in this, uh, this field of cancer. Carlo? So my prescription, I think, um, summarizes m the brilliant ideas that we have heard already, and that is to remove as much as we possibly can barriers across disciplines in our cancer research and making sure that we put together teams uh, creatively so that uh, we can utilize uh, advanced um, uh, ideas in uh, um, uh, clinical trials uh, without having to, um, you know, uh, uh, um, interfere with, um, uh, you know, many roadblocks that may be legal or the like. Uh, so that would be uh, certainly the way uh, I would think uh, we would rapidly achieve better uh, uh, cure rates. Uh, at, uh, in a m much more efficient way. Thank you. Um, I think our time is uh, coming to an end. The Prostate Cancer Foundation believes in many more PhDs, but that's a Milken term for patients helping doctors. <laughs> okay. And we think that patients should have their BAM file at a biopsy, which I, what I said is they should know, they don't need to know all the genes, but they ought to know what's actionable today. And we think that social media and education will create greater leadership 
and incent a lot of the kinds of partnerships at the very basic level because uh, there's so much more discovery to do. As much as we know about cancer, we profoundly are ignorant about much more, but look at what we've been able to accomplish. Um, so uh, many more patients helping doctors, um, and the vector for that are the biomedical research intensive foundations uh, dedicated to putting every dollar they can into research um, and advocating fundamentally for all of these important prescriptions to be filled urgently on behalf of all um, families about to face cancer or patients currently facing cancer. Thank you for being with us today and please thank the panelists.